That's running. Sweet. Okay. Cool. Okay. So second performance piece. Again, repeat. Um, after some great feedback, it will be edited, but I haven't had time to edit it yet. So this is still the original version. All you fans, and someday this will be popular. Like I heard the original before it got. <laughs> there you go. Real. Are you a real poet? He stopped me and asked, "Are you a real poet? What does that mean? Am I a real poet?" I can pinch myself here on the stage for you if you'd like. <laughs> oh, what pain? Empirical evidence that yes, indeed, I am real. We could wax philosophically heavily at that. This is embarrassing. Real. Real? Wait, 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 wait. Please turn off your sound yes. bombs. Yes. Please remember to turn off your sound bombs. Yeah, right. right. We had an established as a big issue. We can schedule someone to call during. It's important. Yes. We should have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Being a parent, you always have your phone on. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Except when you didn't have a phone like us. Yes. <laughs> Things were so much. It was fine. It was yes. Fine. <laughs> They'll survive as long as they don't die. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So maybe you should start. Yeah, just start it. Right? Yeah. Okay. He stopped me and asked, "Are you a real poet?" What does that mean, am I a real poet? I can pitch myself here on the stage for you if you'd like. Ow, pain, empirical evidence that yes, indeed, I am real. We could wax philosophically heavily at that. I do have a degree in the field, after all. We could argue Descartes, to be, to exist, I think, therefore, damn. What was that quote again? What do I call myself? Maybe you should question whether or not I'm a real philosopher. Am I a real poet? Am I a real woman? I've never been asked that before. How do you respond? What quip of the tongue when you remark toward criticism do you just spout out after being asked that? Maybe it was the hair. The outfit. I bet it was the lipstick that made him have to reach out and ask. Maybe pretty words can't come from a pretty tongue, but I don't consider myself pretty, so there goes that theory. Are you a real poet? What the fuck, man? Was Poe a real poet? Dickinson? How about the ones who lie in their graves, never seeing their works printed, never holding their own books, scouring the pages, smelling the ink, decorating the cover, inscribing their name on that inside cover of that first edition to some obsessed fan who says, I think you're the best ever. God, my Valley Girl just came out. <laughs> and yet I had yet to speak when he asked me those words. So I know there was no sweet Valley High overheard to question my ability. But what does that mean, are you a real poet? Who gives someone a license that says, yes, real poet, come on board, we'll bump you up from coach to first class, because you know what, gosh darn it, you're a real poet. I'm sure he meant no harm, no offense. Maybe he just liked taking women off guard, which makes me wonder, how many others had he asked that same question to? And whether or not he would walk up to a man and ask, hey, son, are you a real poet? <laughs> are you a real poet? What does that mean? You know, I don't know. I have the slightest clue what the answer to that question was, other than the fact that yes, I am a real poet. I'm flesh and blood right here in front of you. I can write some good shit on a page and throw some swear word in to make my stuff even stronger, although most times, and some of you can vouch for this, my stuff is clean, a little crude, but very pretty, because I pride myself on the imagery and not so much the sharp blows of content. Yes, I am a real poet, and I'd like to think I'm a pretty damn good one. So thank you, sir, for giving me fuel to fire what I know will be one fucking fantastic performance piece that maybe some old day you'll be there when I perform it, and we'll have a good laugh. And you'll go, you know what? This is what I really meant. And I'll be like, you know what? I don't really give a shit. I got my own answer. And you know what? I got a good poem out of it to boot. So how about them apples? Hell yes, I am. Nothing. Nothing. I looked up because I didn't know. It was just, just like, the start of the like, life. Your brain couldn't process the stupid that we yeah. were to <laughs> <laughs> I just gonna move on. I'm like, yeah. The bad part is they're really prominent in Cleveland poet too, so it's like. Oh. Really do. Oh. oh really? Ouch. Sure that I know. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Well. Well. Oh, well. that's some of them are. <laughs> that's different. I don't want to name any names on camera, but. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Can you tell me later? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you know oh, this. Yeah. Well, from your, 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 from your
Well, this is and I said his name. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, so this was a short one. Um, two years ago, uh, I did a, uh, well, Writing Nights did a uh, kind of a 30 30, which in uh, April means it's uh, 30 problems in 30 days. And the theme was obsolete words or obscure words. And this word was herbal. And herbal means to draw one's limbs in and stretch up the shoulders in reaction to the cold. So whenever someone tells you there's no word that rhymes with purple, it's purple. Orange is orange. I have others, but. It's orange. It's where, like, uh, fungus or whatever, like, spores. It's orange. Okay. Whoa. Uh, all right. <laughs> and what if the spores grow out of fungi on an orange? My mind is blown. My mind You are in orange Inception. All right. Insomnia bursts out of my pores like a spiritual perspiration cooling a body that doesn't bloody need cooled in the 30 degree night. I hurple beneath a robe clad in far less than I should, but my intention is to reduce my body temperatures to unconscious levels to make sleep more appealing to my mind than staying up to think. It's a curse when my mind needs to be exhausted or told bedtime stories from various comedians to resist insomnia. It's a blessing to have a mind that is always considering the chess game of life and ways to move from pawn to knight or rook or bishop, or in some cases, queen. This is deeper truth if the mind also takes into account matters of the heart. No matter how hard I hurble, if my heart cannot pump the vitae of emotion, I will be forever spiritually shivering as my mind quiets to return my body to the sweet repose of sleep. Mm. That was, that was a good challenge, man. Yeah. Oh. Purple. Purple. Jeez. <laughs> 30 days, 30 words. Yeah. Well, that was just. That, that was the word, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that was one word. Yeah. So you um, have to teach us there were 30 words. We're now, 30 poems by the Everybody was doing it. That was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, all right, so like Purple one day would be one word, one word. Like everybody was doing the same word. Uh, well, everyone knew this they did. There weren't that many people who did it, unfortunately. They do that in our world. The like fools. They'll do, you know, 30 days yeah. or something. Like purple. Well, not purple. What a, what a, that's a, that's that's a word. That was one day. Yeah, that was just one day. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, I think 30 30 is too daunting for most poets, so I think next year we're going to do like well, that was a set more 30. Like four poems over thirty days. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Right. But it's gonna be like write it, read it, edit it, etc. for like seven days. Yeah, it makes more sense. Okay. Nice. So this is a this, this poem is called the ground ivy, and ground ivy, in case you don't know, is a common weed that, that is related to mint. It tastes a little like mint. It, it creeps along the ground. It like it really gets up into your lawn and it's impossible to get out. Um, this is, this goes out to anyone who feels like a weed. The ground ivy regrets the extra work it's put you through and the danger it poses to your strawberries. It understands, and if it could have, would not have chosen to be a weed. But weeds must grow, and grow they shall. The ground ivy is not like the grass or the shameless dandelions. It would like to relinquish its hold on your precious soil, although it may find it easier sometimes to lag behind just slightly and return next week to strain your fingers once more. It is sorry, it didn't mean to. But weeds must grow, and grow they shall. The weed ivy thinks if it were as minty as its cousins, the mint, perhaps it could find a home in your garden, not taken, not infiltrated, but allocated for it. But its taste is not as fine, and it grows too low for an easy harvest, and so it must settle for life as a weed. And so as you pile its stems and roots on the pavement to dry, accept its apology, it did not want to die this way. Mm -hmm. So 
is ground ivy good like ground cover if you choose to replace Oh, it'll cover bit. the ground whether you want it to or not. <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, the answer is Ohio yes. Well, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, else. maybe in California it isn't. It's not like herbal. Well, it's not like toxic. It's just like it's going to choke everything else. Well, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. Out, so it. I'm curious how, how, what was the start of that poem, the impetus? Because you were doing, pulling the ground cover. Where did many poems start? I, I usually know. forget where they came from as soon as I wrote them. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. One writer said, um, when I wrote this poem, only me and God knew why I wrote it. Now only God knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ashley continues to ask me where poems came from that I wrote too, and I'm right. like, does it matter? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I kinda, well, I guess for me, I like the provenance uh, because of, I'm what I do, and I like to know where these images how did they come out of you, you know, so that's why, that's all. She'd been there Tuesday, I had stories for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all, that's all, it was just where I was coming from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is called Surrender. This would be a pretty one. Surrender, in the middle of December, amidst the pine and oak and spruce, loosely from his lips came his confession of love for the power of the train. The extension of the track, leading him away from his Puritan life into the wilds of the unknown, into the wilds of the West. He couldn't resist the lust of the rust, thrust into saloons and parlors, cowboys and the lawless. The loveless skies in the desert sucks a man dry, or so I've heard. And nothing I could do in this winter interlude could change his mind and make him stay. Something about the other side of Mississippi's hips called to him. He blundered on to say, the look of a child on Christmas Day. Would I wait for him? I knew his tomb. Stones on the desert floor would be all I'd ever see of him again. What could I do but surrender? Amidst the fates of love had turned their eyes, oh, admit the fates of love had turned their eyes, blind to the die cast on this winter floor. I could hear his confessions of love no more. Just one post he sent his written word, scribbled down in an opiate-driven frenzy of his sins on this sun-baked earth. He had surrendered to her higher power, and then silenced. Mississippi's hips and western tracks are no match for the likes of this woman. As surely 
literally as I'm alive, I'm immortal. Here's how it works. There is no past but a memory. There is no future but a wish. And while memory ends at birth, wishes go on and on. As long as there's mine to imagine, the next thousand years are as real as the end of my next shift at work, or next week. My thoughts in time need, in time need to end with death, as long as death isn't yet. Thoughts can race as fast as a wish or a fantasy, as far into time as time is and does, and witness centuries of history get unmade. The end of this empire, and the rise of the next. The triumphs of heroes turned to tyrants, and their defeats by near new heroes whom I'll see become tyrants themselves again. The aging of land and of sea, the cleansing of man's brutal mark on the soil, and the eons after his influence has waned, and the flourishing of new evolved forms to fill up the caverns dug by the long extinct. I'll see the water and the very air boiling when the sky is filled up by a sun grown too big not to swallow, like time itself, its children. And I'll see its brightness outburned by the oncoming storm of a colliding foreign galaxy, flinging stars like dust in the eyes of my immortal wishing mind. Then, back to now, I'll blink and close my hands around this day, hold tight to my still beating heart, knowing that all moments are now, as surely as I know that one day I will die. Hell yeah. Uh, it's at uh, 16 minutes? Okay. 45 seconds. Okay. This is called Three Days. It happened in three days' time. Day one, life went from our own unique type of normal to chaos. Life with no restrictions suddenly became restricted by rules and wires, monitors and tubes, by prognosis and new limitations. Day two, there was sleep in my own bed and that awful voice inside my head filling me with guilt about going home and not spending the night there by his bedside again. There was a shower, comfy clothes, and then the rushing. The frantic rush hour commute to race across town, parking garage, nightmares of spiraling, climbs and bed, parking jobs, hoping I could be there before he woke up. More waiting, and more waiting, oh God, the waiting, for something to change, for something to be done, for anything other than this really odd status quo. Day three, there was rejoicing. I never thought happiness could be found coming from a urine sample. There was change, commotion, prompting, encouragement, rising up out of his own bed, walking outside of his room for the first time, his own miracle on the third day. New orders, new restrictions, challenges that had to be met before release, and there was relief. He was home by supper time. My three days turned into five as I played mother, nurse, employee, maid, as I tried to give attention to all who were asking, and the questions, how they all asked. I had a script in my head, rehearsed from repeating his story, edited down to a three-minute version, so all who know, or who all who ask, can know. Just a few days ago, I sat out I sat looking out of a large glass window, thinking about the kids here who are so much sicker than my own, who have it so much worse. And I think now how lucky we are to be home. Our normal will evolve and adapt to accept and deal with the chaos that may follow, follow-ups and tasks, more revolving doors and doctors. But there will be normal for us someday, for our own new special kind of normal. And for that, I am thankful. I am very, very thankful. So if you edit, this is where you stop for a second, and I tell the story. My son um, sustained a kidney injury uh, in 2013. He got an elbow to the kidney playing soccer, and we found out he had a birth defect. His kidney, his kidney was bad. Mm -hmm. um, so after much tests and doing and pain and suffering, we realized he had had an operation in his kidney um, to kind of hopefully fix it. Flash forward four years later now, we just found out this morning that he's going to lose it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So he's, it was one of those things like I'm driving here and I'm thinking, and I'm like, I remember, I remember being at Rainbow Babies, writing this poem, thinking like, you know, you, you just want your child to be healthy. And we had some good time. And we know you can live a long time on one. My father's father yeah. lived in 98 on one, lost yeah. during the war, during bad surgery conditions, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. during med and drinking at work days, 
smoking. Like, I know you can live off of kidney, but to be his age and have that. that can you get a new one? He doesn't need it. Um, he'll live, his other one is just fine. It's just one that um, is, is quick now. But it was just one of those, like. I'm surprised you're here. Yeah, he was doing, we had a busy day and he was okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess. We had a really, really, really busy day. And then he's like, go on. Oh. And I how, how old is he? He's 17. Oh. So he was, four years ago, he was 13 when it happened. Yeah. And that was, that was really scary. And now he still doesn't, he's, he still doesn't like it. But, and we have some time. So it's not an emergency. We can do it a couple months from now. But it's still that, like, you're losing something. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. you were just and now you can restart the edit from that. <laughs> we're good. You were just stipulating it. Uh, well, uh, no, I, I like the one third of I, uh, should, should, uh, uh, yeah, like, I'll stop oh, it okay. materially. What's the, what's but, the time? I'll take care of it. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, uh, 21 minutes. All right, um, after I do this one, stop it. Sure. Um, did someone time this also? Yes. <laughs> Before I start it, uh, I guess I'll explain. Um, this is about a woman who I kind of adopted as my surrogate grandmother when I was a teenager because I wasn't really that close to my actual grandparents. So, Are you going to do both pieces together? Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. see how much right. time it is that yeah. I have to go. A cooling late September day, a feisty old woman losing her mind with boredom and despair. Colossal bag. Both breasts biopsied, a lifetime of pain, joys, sorrow, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. A fortune teller once informed her she would have, have the will to survive until her children and grandchildren no longer needed her. Unfortunately, with such codependence surrounding her, she is bound to live forever. I enter her house. The first smell is of animal shit of a non-specific creature. I see a bunny. A little boy calls himself Spider-Man to my girlfriend. It's cute. He looks exactly like his father, who is nowhere to be found today. Puppies play outside. We enter the main part of the trailer where the woman sits in her chair, old and with grooves worn in from decades of use. When I first met her, she was already old. I was dating her granddaughter. She caught us literally with our pants down once. <laughs> but now she's not as mobile. She can't even stand as I enter. But I hug her. We talk about her problems briefly. We talk about my poetry and publishing. She tells me again the story of how she was reading my first book before her granddaughter ran off with it. That reminds me of my new book, and I grab a copy from the car. I sign the back. To Grandma, I love you. She doesn't read the book right away, but tears start rolling down her cheeks. It might be bittersweet, but I like to think I have been able to bring a bit of light to her darkening life. At last, I can't stand the smell of my girlfriend and I have it elsewhere to be. I stand. We stand. Grandma stands shakily. We hug tightly as possible. We share a few more words. We hold hands. Then another hug before slowly slinking out of the house with a promise of a Thanksgiving visit. Two. An unseasonably warm January. A feisty woman wished she could find the strength to no longer be afraid and let go. She's too far gone to be bored now and wants everyone to be okay without her. I wonder if she remembered the fortune teller in her last moment, the one who told her she would survive until her family no longer needed her. I tell her granddaughter, my first real girlfriend, that she knew you loved her, and she loved you with her entire being. You were why she hung on as long as she did. If she is gone, she knew you were ready to face life without her. I'm at work with a malfunctioning internet, but this break in action allows me a chance to reflect on this, the first poem I've written this year. I reflect on the last time I saw her, gravity glued to her hospital bed. When I last saw her, so many new beginnings surrounded her. The granddaughter she loved with her being had a potential new love. The two-year-old child clung to each of them who would squeal with the light of life every couple of minutes. I couldn't hug her because I was afraid of her frailty. But the last kiss I gave her on her forehead whispered that she didn't have to be afraid. The only thing awaiting her was peace. 
That was exactly seven days ago. The last time I saw her on her feet, she stood to hug me about a year ago while I visited. She was still feisty then, but the world weighed upon her. I've made the perfunctory internet status post of rest in peace, and people say they are sorry. I don't dismiss their thanks, I just ask them not to be. I'm not sorry she's gone. I'm glad she no, she's no longer in pain, and that she was in my life. I'm also secretly glad she is at peace, whatever is waiting for her in the beyond or the ecosystem. I hope that when it comes to my time, I am sent into the beyond and the ecosystem to sounds of children squealing with a delay of life. Ooh, I got a lot of Thank you. Uh, Stop. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, back on. Loving the body. Loving the soul requires loving the body, cage that it is, its angular blades cutting the cord to the sky, but leaving space for the truth to bleed through. Loving the body requires loving the death it brings. Yours is the birth and mine is the blade that cuts the cord with wisdom's blood staining my hand. Where you were goddess of light, I am god of death. I'll end the cycle and begin it again with my seed itself. Loving the body requires loving the cycle of life, requires loving the goddess god ring. Loving the soul requires loving the body, beat the drum until the two are one, as only in birth or the clapping of hands. Play on, on his poetic style. Okay. All right. 
It's like, and if they're all three humorous, then it doesn't matter if they relate to each other. It's just the, the connection of it. Yeah. All right. Um, so this one is not that poem. I wish it had. I wish it was that poem. Uh -huh. But um, it's it's at home in my backpack. I didn't bring with me that I usually bring. Um, this one. All right. So this one is. Uh, all right. So there's a musician named Rodriguez who was big, who was not big in the '60s, but he was there. And there was a documentary, Searching for Sugar Man, that came out in like the mid 2000s or like late 2000, almost 2010. And I watched it. Like, oh my God, this is awesome! So I looked up all his music, found all his music. His main song, Sugar Man, has a line in it. Uh, Sugar Man uh, was a, or met a false friend or something like that. And I thought for the longest time it said met a false friend, and so it made a song. <laughs> Metaphor's friend met a false man was a boss man with an embossed gun. An embarrassed grin crossed the degrassed chin, was half-assed in a harassed sin. Once he cashed in just a flash, then he was face down, alley downtown. It was a loud sound, but it's gone now. And the con man, he's gone, man. Metaphor's friend didn't know then that his false friend would be his end. Wooden soul mends, but a bullet bends, and the blood rends, and the light ends. Metaphor's friend was a godsend, and a godson, till he got done. Now his words run, it's the ink blood, and the pen gun, and paper pavement. Willie's sonnets, broken Rorschachs, butterflies pads, hurricanes crash, and the once man who harassed sin met a demon, didn't see him. Sun was absent from the violence. Let a forest friend crawl the streets end and was found then. He was drowning, sirens shrilling, losing feeling, sonnets peeling, face concealing, operating, words were writing, the best for reading, lines are bleeding, pause for breathing, close to ending. Metaphor's friend, he was stitched then, used the lion's end, made the heart bend, karma struck then, and the false man fell at last and the metaphor's friend. He breathed out and he breathed in again. Uh, 